Europe is facing another viral outbreak. This time, it's measles. The good news is that a highly effective vaccine already exists. So why are cases soaring? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. Now, across Europe, there were nearly 45 times more cases of measles last year compared to the year before. So, what's behind the resurgence of measles? High fever, cough, light sensitivity, and of course, the telltale rash. Measles was nearly eradicated in Europe, but now it's reaching alarming levels. Over 42,000 cases were reported in 2023, compared to 941 cases a year earlier, and nearly 21,000 people were admitted to hospital last year. For every thousand people who catch measles, one to three will die. Measles is incredibly contagious. It is passed through droplets in the air from coughing and sneezing. It has a 90% transmission rate from an infected to a non-infected person. People might think that it no longer is a threat and no longer a threat to their own personal health. Um, but because it is so infectious, we need to maintain really high levels of vaccination in, in the, whole of, the whole community. The measles, mumps and rubella, or MMR vaccine, requires two doses. But European vaccination rates for the first jab slipped from 96% in 2019 to 93% in 2022 and the second dose fell from 92% to 91%. It may not sound like a lot, but it means that more than 1.8 million children didn't get all of their jabs. One of the biggest disruptions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic was to, was, was to routine immunization programs in many countries, leading to outbreaks of measles, diphtheria, polio, and yellow fever. Globally, measles is still one of the most lethal infectious diseases for children and measles patients become particularly susceptible to catching pneumonia or meningitis, both of which can also be deadly. In the UK, a nationwide campaign is encouraging parents to get their children vaccinated. It's hoped the push will bring rates back up to 95%, which is the minimum required for everyone to stay protected. Well, let's meet our guests. Joining me from Bristol in England is Dr. Joydeep Gover. He's an emergency medicine consultant. Dr. Mary Ryan is a consultant endocrinologist at the University of Limerick in Ireland. And here with me in the studio is Roy Lilly. He's a former chairman of the UK's National Health Service Trust. Mary, I'll come to you first of all. Just remind our viewers what a nasty disease measles can be. OK, so measles. Um, as we all know, we get it usually as children. Normally we get two vaccines and this has controlled it. And as you know, in the UK, it was very well controlled up to three years ago. But it's actually more contagious than COVID. And uh, it can cause pneumonia, it can cause seizures, it can cause blindness, it can cause meningitis. But it's unbelievably infectious. And this is the worrying trend. And, and of course, what we're concerned about in the UK is that, you know, under 16 year olds, about 3.4 million are at risk of, of actually getting it because of the fact that they're not vaccinated. So I suppose the worry is that it's so contagious that there's so many people unvaccinated because with the COVID pandemic, they mix, missed vaccinations. In particular, there was a focus on getting people vaccinated for COVID and we took our eye off the ball with regard to, to measles. But I suppose the big worry is that it's so contagious, it's so infectious, it can infect healthy people as well as vulnerable. Uh, in, in, with COVID, it could do the same, but this is even more infectious. And um, I suppose that the, the risk is that with, with you know, severe pneumonia, meningitis, uh, seizures, you know, they, they're all things that, that can be fatal. So, so that's the big, big worry. And um, I, I suppose it's trying to get people vaccinated quickly now to prevent. And it's not just in the UK. For example, in, in the UK now, 85% are vaccinated, but we need 94% to get that herd immunity. 
But in Europe, it's the very same thing. Um, there's a huge increase in measles throughout Europe as well, for the very same reason as the UK, because of the fact that vaccinations have fallen behind, really because of, of the COVID pandemic. We just lost out on that. Maybe there was a little fear of vaccinations as well. But I think the big thing is that we, we've just fallen behind it. But it's so infectious way more infectious than COVID. And as I said, you know, really, really causing major illness like meningitis, um, you know, affect the brain and the severe pneumonia as well, the seizures. So th this is the big uh, worry with the measles. And really it's a campaign out, get the, a public campaign out, get people vaccinated and, you know, educate people about it and about the dangers and the risks and how to, to protect public health. That's really what we want to do. Joy Deep, you're in Bristol in the west of England. Just tell us what you're seeing out and about in the community as you do your job. Uh, so we've been uh, on surveillance mode because uh, the county very close to us, West Midlands, is where the uh, epidemic of uh, measles is uh, at the highest in, uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, and we are... Con uh, next to uh, West Midlands. So we have been on our tender hooks waiting for uh, uh, cases to present. We've had uh, a few confirmed cases uh, and we remain very aware and wary that things can get uh, bad very quickly uh, because the vaccination status within the Southwest, uh, as in the rest of uh, the United Kingdom, is not close to the 95% required to not have um, transmission of this disease. Uh, in, in the United Kingdom, the vaccination rates are around 85%. In the West Midlands, it's 74%, uh, which means in West Midlands, one in four children are unprotected, uh, which uh, makes them very, very vulnerable to disease. Uh, while we've not had uh, a huge surge of cases within the Southwest, uh, but we are very uh, cautious uh, that uh, we've had a few confirmed cases and we are worried that there's a lot of vulnerable children who would be exposed to the measles uh, virus. Joy Deep, just for a global international audience, the West Midlands is where Britain's second city, Birmingham, is. What are the reasons, do you think, behind what we're seeing ultimately is vaccine hesitancy from some parents? I think particularly for the MMR, uh, the hesitancy started uh, after Andrew Wakefield's uh, false uh, proclamations that this was related to autism. Um, now, obviously, all that has been debunked uh, by multiple scientific studies, uh, but unfortunately, the, uh, the, the effect is that uh, people feel very reluctant uh, to put that in perspective, and the rates of MMR have dropped significantly, um, which is now catching up with us and uh, making us very worried about the health and safety of children. As Mary said, uh, the consequences of measles are not always deaths. But in young children, measles can leave people uh, and children with pneumonias. Uh, and measles encephalitis is really bad because that can have lifelong consequences of brain damage and seizures. And if pregnant women get measles, then uh, the unborn child can have severe consequences from measles infection. Roy, if we go back to September 2017, the UK was in a position where there hadn't been a case for three years. Measles was beaten. Mm. This was seen as a Victorian disease that had been absolutely trounced. What do you think has gone wrong here? Uh, yeah, and, you know, it's interesting. I, I spoke to a doctor the other day. He said some of his uh, younger colleagues had never seen an incident of measles. So what has gone wrong? Well, I think it's a combination. I think there's vaccine hesitancy, as we've heard from the Wakefield, but, I mean, that was some time ago, so maybe some people have forgotten that. I think there's probably the impact of COVID, where that just sort of interrupted uh, how we kind of looked after people and the general running of the NHS. I think there's been a, a dim diminution of health visiting, um, where health visitors visit new mums. I mean, now they only get five visits and that's it, regardless of the combination. So the health visitors played a very big part. I think it's access as well to the GP. It's not easy to see a GP as it used to be. So I think it, it, it's all of those. I don't think there's one sort of silver bullet, but I think there's silver buckshot. There's a whole load of things that have combined together. And of course, we're seeing a lot of these hotspots occur where there's high levels of local deprivation and, and migrant populations. So you can't ignore the fact 
that there may well be um, English first language problems and the way we communicate this to young mums. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's horrendous. Anybody who's had kids, you know, <laughs> the chaos that comes into your life when you have kids and there's a lot more to think about than, than vaccinations. And the vaccinations aren't simple. It's not just one jab and finished, it's two and then a booster. So, you know, it, it really does mean that we have to keep in contact with people and remind them with all the other stuff that's going on. So uh, my view is it's a combination of things and it's a combination that's being repeated really across the rest of Europe. Well, not all, not totally across Europe. France, of course, uh, um, they have fewer numbers. Uh, because Why is that? Well, it's because they make uh, vaccination uh, obligatory for, for children to attend school. And, uh, you know, this is, I think, the big question here, really, is how do we resolve this? Because if you look at Australia, if it's no jab, it's no creche, no school, and no welfare benefits, uh, family benefits. And, and so, you know, do we, in the interest, you know, to, to do the greatest good for the greatest number, do we say, you know, you surrender that freedom, apart from, you know, medical or religious reasons, we just say you've got to get your kids vaccinated before you put them in school. And, you know, that seems to be a sort of a benign piece of legislation that certainly in Australia, there's almost no pushback. How would that it. be received in Britain? We hear people railing against the nanny state, I nanny know. interference by government. <laughs> I know. And, and look what happened when we tried to oblige uh, NHS staff to have a COVID jab. And I mean, it seemed to me to be somebody who'd run a hospital, you know, it seemed to me to be perfectly straightforward to say to staff, you can't work here unless you have a jab in your own interest, never mind everybody else's. But of course, there was a huge pushback against that. I don't know. I mean, I think sometimes governments have to do the greatest good for the greatest number. You know, I think it was Disraeli who said that. Uh, and, and that's not a bad maxim. You know, it's, it's all very well to bow to a, a vocal social media group that, that, that gives perhaps a false impression of the traction and the voice that they have. But I think, you know, the chief medical officer has to probably, probably not a politician really, but the chief medical officer could, could I'm sure, and he would say that, that this would be a very good thing to do to make our kids safe. That's a very good point. Mary, what are your thoughts on that? Making vaccination for measles mandatory. You can't send a child to school unless they've had two shots of the jab. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good idea. And we know that two shots, shots of the MMR vaccine gives you a 97% effectiveness against contracting it. So that's absolutely fantastic. So, yes, I think when, when you, it's so infectious, it causes so much disease, uh, like we said, encephalitis, a brain injury. You know, there's so much... It's, it's so brilliant that we can eradicate it. But when it comes back and can cause that amount of disease, there's so much downside from it that I think it's a no-brainer that it should be, uh, you know, everyone gets it for the goodness of all and for the well-being of all. And, I, you know, it was interesting that a doctor there hadn't seen it forever. That's what we want to get back to. And God knows there's enough going on with epidemics and so forth, that this is something we can control. We've got a very effective treatment for it. And we know that it's 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 really is very, very safe. So I think and that's been shown time and time again with studies. So I think, yes, I think that's a very good idea. Make do like France, make it compulsory. And and then we're protecting everyone. We're protecting healthy children. We're protecting the vulnerable and we're protecting society. And I think after what we've all been through with the COVID pandemic, we need that and we need that reassurance. And the last thing we can go through is another uh, you know, where p p people are very ill. Because remember, if you've got another epidemic of this, other illnesses and cancers and so forth are being un undiagnosed and misdiagnosed uh, because this is, is taken uh, up space. And uh, we've got to think of all those people as well. So I think in the interest of everyone, we've got a very safe vaccine that we know works. It gives 97% effectiveness of preventing after getting the two dose of vaccine. So I think it's essential that we protect everyone. Um, and we've only got one life and, and let's live it. And we've got a safe vaccine that we know works. So yes, everyone should be, uh, it should be endorsed that they should take it before going to school, definitely, and, and protect the population. And Mary, you're, you're in Limerick in Ireland. How do you think Irish people would feel if the Irish government said from Dublin, everyone has to be vaccinated for a child to start going to school at the age of five? Do you think Irish people yeah. would buy into that maybe? 
I do, and I, but I think again, it's all about communication. I think we learned this with the COVID uh, vaccination and COVID. It's it's about you know giving for doctors to give as much information uh, uh, and do it all in different languages. We're all we're, you know to make sure everyone is educated. But I think the key thing is clear messaging, good communication tell people why, what are the benefits, what are the downsides. And, you know, we're an educated population and I think people will always, if, if, if you're, they're communicated to properly, I find the take up is always very good. And I think that's something as doctors that we haven't been good enough at communicating as to why. And, you know, because if you don't do a proper communication message, then you've got the naysayers that are going to come in and say all the, the, the you know, hype up the, 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 the negatives. But if you explain that these studies have been done, the links to autism are completely uh, wrong. And, you know, you're protecting against encephalitis, you're protecting against pneumonia, you're protecting against seizures, blindness, meningitis, things that can be fatal. Well, then children, you know, parents are always going to protect their children. And once you explain to them and, and make sure that as doctors, you're getting that message across and you're not leaving a vacuum where people, of course, is going to be dissenters. But if you've got a good communication message across, we're educating the public properly and doing it in a, you know, in a very, very well received way and there to answer questions if, if they arise, then you're, you're not allowing those dissenters to come in with a whole load of false information. That, that's the key. Joy, I think just... that's very important. Joy Deep, that's a very good point Mary raises about communication, isn't it? Do you think we need a public awareness campaign, not just in English, but getting into communities in different languages, Urdu, Punjabi, Hindi, Bengali, you know, that we need some leadership from government with these kind of messaging programmes on radio and TV and online that we can perhaps better educate people? Absolutely. This is, uh, as everyone has pointed out, a campaign of hearts and minds. Uh, and while I can see the point of making it mandatory, usually that distracts from the main message. Uh, people nowadays tend to look at anything which is mandatory with skepticism and imposing of uh, someone else's will onto them. So uh, I would go with uh, what Mary is saying, uh, absolutely. This is hearts and minds, and we need to approach all uh, parts of the community in uh, a language which uh, they understand. Uh, because it is not only for their own children's protection that it is required, but there is social responsibility here as well. Every child who's unprotected is a carrier and a harbor for the disease, which can then spread to other unprotected children. And while we, we know that um, most children will have a mild to moderate illness from which they will recover. You don't know which of those unprotected children you might be putting at risk of death or severe disability from not having the vaccine yourself. So there is uh, this responsibility uh, towards the community and towards others, which also needs to be played up. But certainly uh, this is something that uh, needs to be publicized uh, and there has to be campaigns around why it is so important to get the vaccine. Very good point about communication, Roy. Before I come to you on that issue, just take a look at this video. It's Dr. Suj is this guy's name. He's an NHS doctor. He's prolific on TikTok, and he's been talking about measles. Just have a listen to this. There's a measles outbreak in the UK. Here are six things that you need to know. Measles is usually self-limiting with symptoms that should resolve within a week. It starts with cold-like symptoms, so fever, cough, runny nose and conjunctivitis, followed a few days later by a rash, and there may be small white spots in the mouth. Measles is spread when an infected person coughs or sneezes. You can prevent the spread by using tissues to catch coughs and sneezes, then throw them in the bin and wash your hands with soap and water. You might be at risk if you've had significant contact with an infected person. This means being in the same room as them for 15 minutes or more, or face-to-face -face contact. If you're immunosuppressed, any level of contact is assumed to be significant. If you have measles, you should stay away from work, nursery or school for four days after the initial development of the rash and avoid contact with susceptible people. Susceptible people are those who are not fully immunized through vaccination or natural exposure, infants, pregnant women and people with weakened immune systems. And finally, you're unlikely to get measles if you've had both MMR jabs. Right, so we're seeing doctors taking to social media platforms like yes. TikTok. I mean, it works, doesn't it? It does, and that's very persuasive. And it is interesting that we're using new methods of communication, social media. Uh, but look, you know, I come back to this. I, I have this sort of puzzle in my mind, really. Um, and if you think about all of the public health thing, 
things that have worked. Seatbelts in motor cars, crash helmets uh, on motorbikes, smoking in the workplace, health and safety legislation. It is legislation that works. And, I, and you know, we get, a, you know, on one or two, you know, highly prolific sort of odd <laughs> doctors, not odd in the sense of weird, but, you know. It's unusual to see that. Unusual, them. yeah, yeah. To, uh, to see that. Um, and the, the evidence, as we've heard here, is overwhelming. And so you, I think we get to the point where, we, where, at what point did the last Labour government, for, or, or, or it's Tony Blair's government, I think it was, wasn't it? At what point did they say, OK, we've got to intervene in smoking, we're going to ban it in the workplace? At what point did a predecessor government that say we need crash helmets on motorbikes? And on all the Harley Davidson people said, no, no, it won't be the same. And, and there, was, there was government pushback. But you get to the point where government has to decide what government is for. What is the purpose of government? Is it to persuade? Yes, it is. Is it to inform? Yes, it is. Is it to lead? Yes, it is. And, and th those are the tough questions that leaders have to ask themselves. But at the end of the day, this is a decision that will take leadership to resolve. And I don't think it, we can, you know, count are on... Are you confident in the leadership then you're seeing in the UK at that Department of Health levels at government level. No, I'm not, I, I, and I and I think there there would there would and there is a reluctance to to take on these challenging issues. I mean, there if you look at uh, um, it's not quite a, a, a parallel, but if you look at the way these strikes have been handled in the NHS, you know they've just dragged on and on and on when clearly people have to sit down and talk to each other. Talking with preconditions means there's no talking. So that's an issue of leadership. So I think, you know, if you reel that back and say, well, is that the character of this government? Well, yes, it is. Uh, and of course, we've got an election coming and, and who's going to look for a confrontation or a difficult piece of legislation with, you know, under 300 days, we'll have a new government. Mary, I want to address the issue of anti-vaxxers. A lot of misinformation spread online. What would you say to any parent out there who's listening to the debate and isn't sure about getting the MMR jab for their child? What would you say to them? I would say to them to get their information from a, a medical source. I think that's really important to listen to the right people. Um, you know, as medics, and I'm lecturing in medicine as well, you know, we're, we're, we do a long training and um, we take our, our resources from evidence-based medicine. And I think that's very, very important. Everything is peer reviewed. <laughs> so I think that, you know, I would urge the public and parents would always listen to uh, the medics to, who will give the proper advice. Their regulators were, you know, with the medical councils overlooking us. And, and that's for a good thing. That's to protect the public. I always say to my patients when they start printing off stuff from, from um you know, uh, Google, I say, Dr. Google it just doesn't have a medical degree. And I've no problem with people asking questions. That's all part of the communication process. But it's really important that you get your information from a credit, credited source. And that's really important because there's too many people giving false information. There's too many people coming from different angles. But as doctors and as nurses, we're here to look after people. You, you know, these are, are uh, careers that really are a vocation. You know, you don't go into it unless you have a passion for it. So you're coming from a good place. You're wanting to protect people. You're wanting to give out right information. So I would urge parents who are, uh, as a parent myself, you're always doing the best for your child to get their information from a good credit source, from a, a medical person who knows what they're talking about and not to be listening to oh, all of these uh, others that are not accredited. I think that's very, very important. And it's, it's wonderful to see doctors coming on social media because it's a different uh, way of communicating and maybe you're reaching a broader um, population with that. But just make sure that the person that's, that's talking is is uh, you know uh, a doctor and uh, accredited by the, their medical council, be it wherever they're from. That's really important. Joy Deep, you've spent your entire life in medicine. <coughs> How worried do you get when you see some of this disinformation online about something as safe and as trusted as the MMR vaccine? Yes. So you know, I, I still come. I still remember the times. Uh, when people used to get measles very often uh, and they used to get really sick from it. Now, public memory can be very short. Um, and in the current, as you say, the last 20 years or so, people have forgotten what 
uh, problems measles could cause. So, you know, the grandparents have forgotten, uh, the parents haven't lived through measles. So they just are unable to weigh the risks and uh, benefits of a vaccination. Um, and it would be very unwise for people to learn from the hard way and see their children being seriously infected and left possibly disabled uh, from from uh, a completely preventable disease. It, 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 it pains my heart to see where we are. And I think the arguments for uh, mandatory vaccination or really coercive vaccination are hard to ignore. Uh, but but I do still feel that there is a hearts and minds game here. I think we, sh we can and we should do much better at communicating and uh, making people realize that how bad a disease measles used to be. Uh, and it's coming back. Uh, the cases are going up uh, hugely, you know, from 260 cases three years ago, we have already over a thousand cases in the last year. Um, and with 25% of the children not fully protected, nearly 2 million children at risk, uh, this can go really bad. Roy, Joy Deep and Mary, thank you all so much for your contribution. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for Roundtable TRT World. And if you like what you've heard today, do hit that subscribe button. But for now, from me and the Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.